Welcome to church. My name's Brian, if we haven't met yet, one of the pastors here, and I am very excited to be with you this morning for part three of our series, Community on Mission, through the book of First John, line by line. So if you've got a Bible or a Bible-equipped mobile device, would love to encourage you to open up to First John chapter two. It's on page 1021 on the Bibles underneath the seat in front of you. Now, as we get rolling this morning, uh, I would imagine most all of us would agree that, that a life of following Jesus, that in, in a life of following Jesus, our faith is meant to make some sort of practical difference in our lives. That, that's not like a deep revelation. None of you are writing that down. That's not news to any of you. Our faith is meant to make some sort of practical difference. That's probably part of why you're here, is because you believe this matters and it makes a difference. If any one of us were to, were to see someone's testimony or their story, of faith, and they were to say, well, this is what I was like before I met Jesus, and then I met Jesus, and then absolutely nothing changed. I'm the same as I was before in every regard. I don't know about you, that would at least lead to some follow-up questions for me, right? Like, it's meant to make a difference, but we need to be very careful and very clear about the difference that it is meant to make. Specifically, we need to be clear that a life of following Jesus is not about behavior modification. It is about heart transformation. It is not about behavior modification. It is about heart transformation, and we need to be especially careful because a life that is motivated by some sort of behavioral modification and a life that is motivated by a truly transformed heart can look the same for a while, but they are actually radically different. Like take for example, if someone begins serving, whether it's in church or out in the community, they begin giving their time for, for a cause that they believe in, but they're doing it because they, they're trying to perform right, they're trying to do something that is morally good, or they're, trying to, they're motivated by some sort of religious performance. That might work okay for a little while, but in the end, bitterness and anger are going to creep in, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. In the end, it's going to feel more like a burden than a joy. If your heart's not really in it, but you're serving just out of obligation, that's not going to work for you. But if you're serving or giving of your time and your talents because your heart has been changed by Jesus and you want to serve and bless people, then serving becomes a joy. Serving becomes energizing. Serving is joyful, not joyless. And we could say the same thing about generosity, we could say the same thing about church attendance, we could say the same thing even about the way that you approach your job. If you're motivated only by duty and obligation, your job, no matter what it is, is probably not going to be that life-giving for you. But if you're motivated by a changed heart that says, because Jesus lives in me, that infuses everything I do with meaning, and I am going to my job as a representative of him. I'm going to my job not to worship my work, but I can work as worship. That infuses everything with meanings. Two, meaning, meaning, two people whose exterior might look the same, but interior, it's very different. We need to be very clear that we're not about pointing you or anyone else to a set of behaviors. We're about pointing one another to a savior who transforms our heart. We are not about behavior modification. We're about heart transformation. And I want to direct you uh, to the fill in the blank that's either on the handout you received when you walked in or if it's on the app if you're following along that way. And it's simply this. Love inspires obedience. Love inspires obedience. If I know that you love me, and I know that you truly have my best interests at heart, and I know that you're competent, that's important, I'm going to do what you say. I am going to take your advice. Now, if I know you love me, but I know that you're incompetent, that's a different conversation. But if I know that you love me, and I know that you're competent, I'm going to do what you say, because I know you have my best interests at heart. That is why throughout the scriptures, throughout the scriptures, God is constantly seeking to remind us of his love for us. He's constantly seeking to motivate us by obedience, not by, or excuse me, motivate us to obedience by love, not by anything else. And we're gonna get to more of that as we get into our text from this morning. Now, in the book of 1 John, we saw two weeks ago, at the end of chapter one, John is talking about sin, and he says, if any of us deny that we're sinful, we're, we're kidding ourselves, we're lying about sin. That. The truth is not in us, but the good news is that we have a God who is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then he moves into verse, chapter 2, excuse me, verse 1, and he says this. 
He says, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Now, real quick, we need to be clear that this term little children, it is not meant to be derogatory or condescending. This isn't John saying, okay, we're not gonna sin today, are we? Come on, little guy, we're not, oh no, we're not, oh no. No, that's not what's going on at all. This is an old man writing to other adults, and what he is doing is he is, this is a term of pastoral love and affection. He's saying, I need you to understand, I care for you with fatherly love. I need you to understand, I have your best interests at heart. And, we need to, and, and also, we need to understand that having a pastoral heart, having the heart of a pastor, which John has, that has nothing to do with your profession. In fact, a lot of damage has been done by people who are pastors by profession, but who lacked a pastoral heart. So they sought to motivate people through guilt and through manipulation and through shame, and that is, that is absolutely unhealthy. When I talk about having a pastoral heart, I'm talking about caring for the hearts of people. And that's something any one of us can have. I'm talking about having grace and compassion. I'm talking about wanting to see others thrive. That's a pastoral heart, and that is the heart that John has. He's gonna have some difficult and challenging words for them. But he needs them to know, before he gets to any of that, he needs them to know, I love you with pastoral love and affection. One commentator I read this week, I love the way that they put this, they said that he is seeking to love them into goodness. He wants to love them into goodness. And then he says, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Now on the surface, that seems impossible, right? He may as well be saying, I'm, I'm writing to you so that you may fly, or I'm writing to you so that you may never have to pay taxes, or I'm writing to you so that the Sacramento Kings will have a winning season. It's just things that are impossible and will never happen, right? <laughs> But, but 26 days till NBA basketball, can't wait. But he said at the end of chapter one, he said at the end of chapter one, that if we have not, if we say we have not sinned, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. So, so the idea here is not that you and I would be perfect, but the idea that John is communicating is saying my heart for you as a pastor is that you would avoid missing the mark of God's best for you that you would avoid missing the mark of God's best for you, and instead, you would be all that God has created you to be. Now, as John is talking about sin, I want to talk about sin for a second. You're welcome. First, the term is incredibly broad. Any, anything that causes us to miss the mark of obedience to Jesus Christ is sin. And in the big picture, sin is ultimately a matter of affection. Sin is a matter of affection because the reason that you and I sin, the, you, the reason that you and I miss the mark of obedience to Jesus ultimately comes down to us beginning to believe, either consciously or subconsciously, that there is something better for us outside of Jesus. That is what is ultimately behind all of our sin, and that is why, and I alluded to this a moment ago, that throughout the book of 1 John, and really throughout the scriptures, it's clear that God is seeking to motivate his people towards holiness with reminders of his love. He, motivate, he seeks to motivate us with reminders of his love. I think back to the nation of Israel, after God had rescued them out of slavery, he, he, when, when God was giving them commands, he would say things like, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, and then he would give some instruction. And, and what's going on here is it's not saying, I, I am the Lord your God, I have brought you out of Egypt and now you owe me. It's him saying, kids, I need you to understand, I had your best interests at heart back then, so you can trust that I have your best interests at heart now, and I'm gonna have your best interests at heart in the future. You can trust me, I love you, and I'm competent, so you can obey me, and you can know that that is gonna lead to your joy. Sin is ultimately a matter of affection. So, we, so the biggest weapon we have to fight our sin is not do better, try harder. The biggest weapon that we have is the love of God. Amen. To return to the love of God, to be reminded by, of the love of God, to, to remember that actually whatever it is we think we're gonna find out there is not, is not as good and wholly satisfying as what we can find through obedience to Jesus Christ. So that's one, big picture, sin is about affections. It is about our affections. If we seek to motivate ourselves through, through guilt or shame or just being harsh with ourselves or others, it's not going to work. We're motivated by love. God seeks to motivate us through affection. 
That's number one. Number two, there is, a, there, is a, there is a way that sin can operate that's different than that, and that can be a little bit tricky. It can sort of operate under the radar. Let me illustrate it this way. If any of you have ever had a water leak in your home, you know that part of what makes a water leak so dangerous is that oftentimes a leak can be undetected for a while, and then maybe for a longer while, until one day a little like bubble shows up in your ceiling and then the ceiling caves in, right? And it's like, I think we have a water leak, right? In the same way, unhealthy and toxic motivations can exist in our heart, and like the water leak, they are undetectable at first, but in time, they begin to wreak havoc. I, I alluded a moment ago to being motivated by religious performance and how problematic that could be. Well, at first, it could actually work okay. If we're motivated by religious performance because we want to be good, because we believe we should be good, that can actually go well for us. Maybe we start to serve, we start to give, we're regular at church and all of this stuff. So on the exterior, it looks like, man, there's someone who's really following hard after Jesus. But then what happens? After a while, maybe some arrogance begins to sneak in. Like, man, I'm, I'm way better at this than everybody else, right? Or, or maybe some, some bitterness and anger begins to sneak in. Why isn't anyone noticing how, how I am the best servant there ever was? Why isn't more, more people noticing that, right? Or, or some frustration begins to sneak in where we sort of look at other people and we start judging them. Man, they're not, they're not keeping up the, with the rules as well as I am. Or then, and then this is where it ultimately leads. Eventually it leads to despair because we realize we're not even keeping up with what we feel like we need to do. What is that? That is something unhealthy operating under the radar. It's like the water leak that goes undetected for a little while, but in the end, the roof caves in. And that is why, and that is why awareness of our sin, the knowledge of our sin, that, that God would be so kind to us to make us aware of those unhealthy motivations, to make us aware of what's going on in our heart that is ultimately going to lead us astray, that that is actually a precious gift to have God reveal to us, you know, there's some things going on in your heart that just are not that healthy, like everything looks fine on the outside, but if you really look at what's motivating you, you're not motivated by love, you're motivated by something else. For God to do that is a gift. For God to make us aware of that is a gift, why? Because a water leak that has been detected loses its power. A water leak that has been detected loses its power. When God makes us aware of our sinful motivations, we can repent and we can change. So sin is ultimately about our affection. Sin often operates underneath the surface like a water leak that goes undetected for a while. And then one more comment about sin before we move on is whose sin bothers you the most? Wh whose sin bothers you the most, because it is really easy to point out the sin in other people. It's really easy to look out in the world and look at people that are far from God and, and point out their sin, and they're like, I don't care. <laughs> it is a much more vulnerable thing to look in the mirror and say, God, where am I falling short? Where, where, am, where am I missing the mark of obedience to you? Because here's what I think we tend to do. I mean, there are all sorts of different ways that you and I struggle with sin, and, you, and we're all different, so we struggle in different ways. And what we do is we tend to look at sins that are different than the sins that we struggle with. We tend to look at sin that to us looks weird or unusual, or why would anyone do that, or I don't understand it, or that seems silly or stupid to me. I don't struggle in that way. So what we do is we look at people who struggle differently than we do, and we condemn them and judge them harshly, all the while making all sorts of excuses for ourselves. How do I know we do that? Because I've caught myself doing it. Because I've caught myself doing it. And I've just kind of realized I don't want to live that way. I don't want to be that guy who's, who's pointing out the sins of other people but doesn't care about what's going on in my heart. I, want, I don't want sin operating underneath the surface and I'm covering it up by pointing out the flaws in other people. I want to be made aware of what's going on in my heart. I want to be able to talk about my sin. I want to be able to confess my sin. I want to have people who are able to come around me and pray for me in my sin. I want to have people who can remind me of the gospel, who can point me to Jesus in the midst of my sin. Nothing gets solved if all we're doing is pointing out the errors in others. 
But a lot gets solved when we start to say, God, where, where do I need to confess? Where am I missing the mark? And here's, here's the beautiful gift that we have as Christ followers. The beautiful gift that we have is we have the means to address our sin in a healthy manner. Why? Because, because we have a God who, First John says, is faithful and just and ready to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness when we confess. We have nothing to fear in confession. We have everything to fear in keeping our sin secret. We have everything to fear in remaining ignorant to our own sin because to go back to my little water leak analogy, when the water leak is caught, it loses its power. And to extend that a little bit further, God is the greatest repairman there ever was, right? So we need to be aware of our own stuff, knowing there's nothing to fear in that. So John says, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. But then what comes next is absolutely critical. He says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Note he does not say, if anyone does sin, they should be full of guilt and shame. He does not say, well, if anyone does sin, they need to do a random good deed to like counteract the like scales of justice or whatever. Or if anyone does sin, they better be careful because karma is not very nice. That's not what he says. He says, if anyone does sin, and by the way, the Greek grammar here implies strong probability. So he's saying, if anyone does sin, and you will, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And I thought this was pretty cool. This word advocate that is used in 1 John chapter two. If you go to the Gospel of John, when Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit, and he says, I will send you a helper, it's the exact same word used in both places. Translated helper in John's gospel, translated advocate in 1 John. The idea is, is it somebody who comes to help in a time of need, or it even carries with it the connotation of someone who provides a legal defense. In our sin, we have somebody who comes to our defense, and his name is Jesus, and the defense he provides is not, no, no, they're actually righteous. The defense he provides is, I have been righteous for them. I have been righteous for them. Then verse two says, he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Propitiation. This week's challenge is to use the word propitiation in an original sentence that is not about Jesus. Don't do that, that is weird. But what does that word mean? What does it mean that Jesus is our propitiation? It's a, it's a, it's a bizarre word, but it's a beautiful word. Here's what it means, a propitiation is that which turns wrath into favor. A propitiation turns wrath into favor. The Bible teaches that there is such a thing as God's wrath. And unlike you and I, when we get sort of tied up with wrath, God's wrath is not selfish. God's wrath is not capricious. God's wrath is not vindictive. God's wrath is perfect and God's wrath is just, and it is very real. God looks at sin with, with wrath, and what Jesus does as our propitiation is he satisfies God's wrath towards sin so that when God looks at us, he does not see our sinful imperfection, but rather he sees Christ's sinless perfection, and so he looks upon us with favor. Jesus satisfies God's wrath so that God looks at us only with favor. That's good news. That's good news. Jesus is our advocate. When we stand accused by our sin, he comes to our defense, not with our righteousness, but his. He is our propitiation, meaning he turns God's wrath into favor. And to be clear, I don't mean, when I say God's favor, I don't mean health and wealth and all that stuff. What I mean is that you and I can live with the peace of knowing that God's favor towards Jesus belongs to us if our faith is in him. And this is admittedly a little bit of a tricky concept to understand accurately, because if we leave it right there and just move on, it sort of sounds like, okay, uh, God the Father is really angry and he's coming to get us, but good thing Jesus steps in the way to save us from angry God the Father. It's easy to make it look like God the Father is the bad guy here and God the Son, Jesus, is the good guy. And we need to be clear that that's not the case. They're both the good guy. As a matter of fact, in the book of Romans, you don't need to turn there but in the book of Romans, it says this. It says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, don't miss this part, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. 
Paul, the author of Romans, is saying that no one of us could go into the courtroom where we are judged by God's law and emerge innocent. Every one of us is guilty. And yet, Romans, like 1 John, tells us that Jesus is our propitiation. And whose idea was it to send Jesus as our propitiation? It was God's. That God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in perfect community God the Father sent the Son to be the propitiation for our sins. God set in motion from eternity past that a day would come when he would send his Son into the world to pay the penalty for our sins so that his wrath towards sin would be completely absorbed on the cross and once again, all that would be left for us is his favor. That's a propitiation. And John says that Jesus is the propitiation for the sins of the whole world world. What does that mean? That means that salvation is open to anyone, to the Jew, to the Gentile, to male or female, to young or old, to rich or poor, to the judgmental religious person, to the self-worshipping workaholic, for the person who sold their soul for fame or for fortune or for power, for anyone, anywhere from any tribe, tongue, and nation, salvation is open to all who would believe and be justified by his grace. That's, what, that's good news, that's good news, right? <laughs> Understand, you don't have to be your own advocate. I think it's amazing, we can walk, for, walk with Jesus for years and years and yet we still feel like we need to kind of be our own advocate. It's like we don't really believe that grace is for us. You don't have to get your life together so it's shiny enough. You don't have to shove all your junk in the closet and hope that God doesn't see it. You have an advocate in your sin. His name is Jesus. You have a propitiation for your sin who turns wrath into favor. His name is Jesus. Jesus took all of God's wrath. God is fresh out of wrath for you, I'm sorry to say. All that's left is favor. All that's left is favor. Now, quickly, we're talking community on mission in this series. So quickly, I just wanna flesh out a couple of important points for why this matters for our life in community on mission. And I meant to say at the beginning, we're spending most of our time on chapter two, or on verse two. It'll pick up after this, I promise. But here, here are a couple of implications. Number one, because Jesus is our propitiation, there should be absolutely no place in the world where it is safer to admit your struggles and shortcomings than Christian community. There should be absolutely no place in the world where it is safer to admit your struggles or shortcomings than Christian community. Now listen, I get that has not historically been the case. But a Christian community is a community formed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in such a community, we're able to listen deeply to one another. We're able to form relationships with one another. We're able to show grace to each other. We're able to pray for one another. We're able to point one another to Jesus. We're able to remind one another that Jesus has paid for our sin. We're able to remind one another that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. We're able to love one another into Christ's likeness. That's what we can do in Christian community. And, and, and listen, if you've experienced this, you know that there are few things more toxic to your soul than putting on the front that everything is okay when underneath you're hurting. When underneath you're hurting. And yet, in so many places in our world, it is unsafe to admit that we're struggling, that we're hurting, that we actually don't have it all together, that we're actually not sure about X, Y, and Z, that we're just having a tough time. And a Christian community has to be a community where we can bring our darkness into light and not be met with condemnation and shame, but instead be met with sanctifying, cleansing, life-giving grace. There should be no place in the world where it is safer to admit our struggles and shortcomings than Christian community. Number two, because Jesus is your propitiation, you can be free from the bitterness and anger you carry towards those who have hurt you. There are a lot of us in this room who are we're living life and we're, we're carrying guilt over things that we've done. And the message that, that God has for you is that you can take that guilt to the cross of Jesus Christ and know that your debt has been paid, that your sin has been paid for, and you can walk in freedom. There are others of us who the burden we're living with is not what we've done. The burden we're living with is we're continuing to feel pain from what was done to us. And because Jesus is your propitiation, you don't have to carry that bitterness and anger anymore because Jesus died not only for the sins you committed, he died for the sins committed against you. 
So that means you don't have to spend your life wishing that they would, somebody would pay them back. They will pay for their sin eventually or they will give it to Jesus and they will know it has been paid for. Either way, you don't have to carry that bitterness and anger any longer. What does that have to do with community? I think it has everything to do with community because if you're anything like me, when you're walking in that pain, it's really hard to see that. It's really hard to see that. What we need is we need our brothers and sisters who have a little bit of emotional distance from what's going on with us and they can come to us and they can say, you know, you can release that. You know, Jesus wants to take that burden from you. We need one another to help us see that God not only forgives what we have done, God forgives that which was done against us so we don't have to walk in bitterness and in anger. Now, real quick, I wanna be crystal clear about what I'm not saying. Number one, I'm not saying we don't report crimes, we do. There have been far too many stories in the news in recent months and years of churches that have tried to say to to victims of crimes within churches, they've said, no, no, you don't need to go to the authorities, we'll handle this in-house and you need to forgive. That is a lie from the pit of hell. I'm not saying, I'm not at all saying we don't report crimes, we do, full stop. Second, If you're walking in that bitterness and anger over something that has been done to you, it would be easy to hear what I'm saying and say, okay, great. Well, I'm really angry about something that has been done to me, and now you're telling me that I can forgive, and now I just feel guilty because I don't feel like I'm in a place where I can forgive. Thank you very much. Glad I came to church today. (laughs) And listen, if that's you, I need to understand that that's not the case at all. Listen, don't miss this the grace that will ultimately empower you to forgive completely is yours every step of the way. Forgiveness is a process and there is grace for you every step of the way and one day that grace will allow you to be free. There's no guilt for you. There's no guilt. There's only grace. There's only grace. Third, Because of what Jesus has done for us, our lives are not about what we're working for, they're about what we're working from, what we're living from. Our lives are not about what we're working for, our lives are about what we're living from. We don't work for God's favor, we live from God's favor. We don't work for a secure identity, we live from a secure identity. We don't work for approval. Come on, how many people in this world are just spinning their wheels going crazy for some sort of approval? We do not do that, we live from the approval of our Heavenly Father. We don't work for closeness with God that is made possible by our moral goodness. We live from closeness with God that has been made possible by Christ's righteousness. We don't try to be obedient to earn love. We receive love that is greater than anything we could ever hope to earn, and we respond with joyful obedience. I need you to understand there's grace for you. At the cross of Jesus Christ, there's grace for you. And see, part of the reason why we need one another is because every single one of us, we have to live with our internal monologue 24 hours a day. And I don't know about you, but my inner monologue is a jerk. Like my inner, like he's really mean. He says mean and nasty things to me all the time. You should definitely not hang out with him, right? I have to live with my internal monologue all the time and, if, and, and, and you do too. And if yours is anything like mine, You you need people to come alongside of you that can remind you of God's grace. You need people to come alongside of you who can remind you, no, actually, yes, your internal monologue is a jerk and he or she also a liar. (laughs) There is grace for you. There's grace for you. When we listen to our inner critic, it impacts our lives in so many different ways. We're harsh and demanding with ourselves, we're, so that makes us harsh and demanding with others. We're nervous, we're stressed out, we don't sleep well. Or maybe, if, if this, is, this is a big one for me, it's like you can't even take a compliment because anytime someone says something nice, it's like it rouses your inner monologue from its slumber and it just goes into hyperdrive. They don't mean it, they're just saying that. They have an angle here, no you're not, you're a loser. Like, you just can't even, you can't even take a compliment and all this stuff just gets messed up and we're always feeling guilty about something. Can anyone relate to that one? Why? Because we're listening to our inner critic instead of the voice of truth. And we need people who don't listen to our inner critic 24 hours a day to remind us of grace. And we need to remind them as well because they've got their own inner critic. We need to be reminded that our debt is paid. We need to be reminded that we can live in freedom and hope and joy and we don't need to let sin conquer us but because we can conquer it. Why? Because there's grace for us. Because Jesus is our advocate. Jesus is our propitiation and if we let that define us, it'll alter the trajectory of our lives in all of the best 
possible ways. I mean, think about, let me just, just go at this from one other, one other angle. Think about how much tension and toxicity in your life is ultimately the result of insecurity. Seriously. I mean, imagine how, how many of the issues in your marriage are the result of either your insecurity or your spouse's insecurity? Why is it that you don't, even have to, you don't even have to think about it? You're just automatically jealous of other people. Why is that? You're insecure. Why, why is it that you can never have a constructive conversation about your shortcomings? It's because you're insecure. Now, listen. Just so you know where I'm coming from is if there was an insecurity club, I would make myself president and then be insecure that no one else would join, all right? So like, that's just my world. This thing's got its hooks in me deep. I'm speaking from firsthand experience here. I know that insecurity can drag us down. I know that firsthand. But I also know firsthand the freedom that comes from realizing there's grace for me and that I'm not defined by my insecurity, that I'm actually called and redeemed and justified by God. So I can, I can live with grace, live from a place of grace, not insecurity. For everything that is broken in me, I have an advocate who comes to my defense and his name is Jesus and he's really, really good at his job. And if you, like me, struggle with that kind of insecurity, you need to remember that as well. I need people to remind me that there's grace for me and chances are you do too. That's why we need each other. Verse three. And by this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Now, these are very carefully chosen words by John. He's writing into a, into a culture with lots of spiritual and religious ideas, and one idea that was beginning to kind of take shape was a concept called Gnosticism, and we're not gonna get into it in any great depth, but all you need to know is this is that Gnostics believed that sort of the key to spiritual enlightenment was just attaining some special spiritual knowledge. That that knowledge didn't make any practical difference in the world, but, but spiritual enlightenment was all about knowing special things. And John is saying, no, that's actually not true at all. The way you know God is not by saying you've gained some secret knowledge, but it's by keeping his commandments. In fact, John goes on to say in verse four, Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. True knowledge of God leads to obedience to his commands, and obedience is objective evidence of our knowledge. Why? Because when we see God as he truly is, when we see the incredible love that he has for us displayed on the cross of Jesus Christ, when we experience what it's like to be filled and empowered by his Holy Spirit, that cannot help but produce obedience in us. Obedience that is motivated not by guilt or religious performance, but obedience that is motivated by love. Are we still gonna struggle? Are we gonna still have areas of, of misalignment? Will we, still have, will we constantly still be in need of an advocate who covers us with his righteousness? Yes, yes, and yes. But if we really know him, if we really see Jesus as he truly is, it'll change us. It'll change us. See, you and I, we can live a life of religious performance and remain unchanged. We can live a life that is, that is motivated, we can live a life that is motivated simply by sin management and remain unchanged. But when we see that in our brokenness, we were objects of God's wrath, but Jesus was a propitiation for us, leaving only favor, that changes us. That changes us. So that means the key for you and I, we talk about sin is motivated by our affection. So the key to conquering our sin is not do better, try harder. The key is to press more into Jesus, to experience more of him, to see him as he truly is, and to allow him to continue to change us and transform us. Why? Because love inspires obedience, and grace inspires obedience. Verse five. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. It's perfected. It is when our lives are a picture of obedience to Jesus Christ that God's love has done what it was meant to do, his love is perfected for us. In, in John's gospel, when Jesus is hanging on the cross with his dying breath, he says these words, he says, it is finished. In other words, I have done what I've come to accomplish. I've come and I've lived, I've preached the kingdom of God, and I'm dying on the cross for the sins of the world. What I have sought to do has been accomplished, it is finished. It is the exact same word that 1 John here uses to say perfected. It's the idea of completion. 
The idea when you and I, when we live lives of obedience, that the love of God has done what is intended to do. I said a minute ago that this idea of Gnosticism was taking shape. And Gnostics believed that, again, sort of knowledge was kind of an end in and of itself. And John is saying, no, no, that's not true. That's not true at all. That the love of God is meant to inspire obedience. And when we're obedient, that means that the love of God has accomplished its work in us. And also we need to understand that God's invitation to obedience, that is a beautiful and gracious, loving gift on his behalf. Why? Because that is life as God intended it. That is the life that God designed. We will find the most joy, we will find the most fulfillment when we are walking in obedience with him. Our God is a God who is seeking to transform us day by day to be transformed by his love so that that love is perfected and so that we walk in joyful obedience. Let's finish it out. Verse five, going into verse six. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Our abiding in him, our remaining close to him, same word in Greek, our being connected with him causes us to walk in the manner in which Jesus walked. Once again, it's not knowledge for knowledge's sake. It's knowledge that then leads to a transformed life, a transformed life. If we abide in him, if we remain close to him, if, if, if we're remaining in him, if we're, if we're understanding his life, if we're studying his words, if we're studying his ways, that will cause us to walk in him. Let me illustrate this with kind of a silly example. I love that we live in a day and age where you can learn to do pretty much anything on YouTube. It's phenomenal. Like any other, like, okay, I don't know how to do, like, forget directions. I'm going to watch a video about it, right? Like, for example, a while ago, I needed to change out the windshield wipers on my car, and I'm not really a car guy, and I, you know, the instructions weren't that clear. So I just type in the model number into YouTube, and boom, five minutes, got a video, all right, I know what I'm doing. You know, install the windshield wipers, and they work great. Fantastic. Thank you, YouTube. Or a little while ago, uh, we moved, and the microwave in our new house didn't work very well, so we were going to need to replace it. So I'm like, how hard is it to replace an over-the-range microwave? So I watched a YouTube video on how to replace it, and that inspired me to hire a professional. Professional. It's like, I am going to break this house if I try to do this, right? But the fact is, it's sort of a silly example, but the fact is, we can, we can okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to watch this video, and then I can imitate it. And then I can do what I've seen in the video. It's a silly example, but it's the same idea. That we're meant to abide in Jesus. We're meant to be formed by Jesus. We're meant to be familiar with Jesus. And then we're meant to go out and imitate him. We're meant to go out and imitate him, to walk in the same manner that he walked. And so we've each got to ask this question. We have to ask it together as a community. We have to ask it if you're in a missional community, it's worth asking together with your missional community. And we each have to ask it individually. Where am I abiding? Where am I remaining? What, where, or, or let's put it in the, in the plural, where are we abiding? What are we allowing to shape us and form us? This is, this is something I'm seeing more and more recently, is that far too many of us, we are bothered by the truth of God's word because we show up to church, but we're abiding somewhere else. We show up to church, but we're being formed by something else. We're abiding with voices that are encouraging us to be afraid, and there are plenty of those out there. We're abiding with voices that, encur that are encouraging us to be exclusive rather than in inclusive. We're abiding with voices that are encouraging us to hate our enemies and point the finger at our enemies instead of voices that encourage us to love our enemies as Jesus instructed. We're abiding with voices that are teaching us the coward's catchphrase of but what about instead of voices that are teaching us to let God search us and know us and reveal what is not right in us instead of just trying to shift the blame somewhere else. And listen, there are voices like that across the ideological spectrum. And you and I, we must be careful. If we're gonna be followers of Jesus Christ, we must not abide in, within earshot of such voices. But we need to abide in the voice of truth. And when we remain in him, when we walk in the manner in which he walked, fueled by our abiding. See, that's when real change 
starts to happen. That's when we see our character begin to transform. That's when we see broken relationships begin to heal. That's when we see the values of Jesus permeate our community because we're living it. We are the ones doing the permeating. That's when we see the power of God as the Holy Spirit is unleashed and miracles are happening. That's when we see real change in us, in our community, and in the world. And at the end of the day, isn't that what we want? We want that kind of change, and it starts with us. It starts with us, with our abiding, with our remaining. So may we be a community that abides in Jesus. May we know that he is our advocate, and he is our propitiation. May we know him in such a way that his love transforms us, May we see that his way is best and may we be people who live lives of joyful obedience inspired by love. Amen? Amen. I want to invite the prayer team up. These men and women would be absolutely thrilled to have the opportunity to pray for you. So if there's anything that was stirred up in the message today, come, come see them. If there's anything that you walked in here with uh, that's unrelated to what we've talked about today, come, come see them. They would count it an honor and a privilege uh, to pray for you. But let me, let me just pray a blessing over all of us and, and, and we'll go. God, we thank you so much that in our brokenness we have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. We thank you so much that we have a propitiation who turns wrath towards sin into favor for us. God, so many of us, we live our lives feeling like we need to advocate for ourselves, that we need to do enough, that we need to try harder, that we need to do something to to appease our sense of guilt, our inner critic, and all of that. God, I pray that you would drown all of that out in each one of us with the voice of truth. I pray that we would be a community that preaches the gospel to one another, that when we are broken by our sin, that we would be a community that comes alongside each other and points us to the cross to remind us that our sin is paid for, to remind us that the Holy Spirit lives in us and is working in us to transform us towards holiness. May we be people who experience your love in such a profound way that we live lives of obedience without a hint of religious obligation and instead lives that are inspired entirely by your great love for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend.